Uh, tonight, we are joined by medical doctor Diane Hennessy Powell. Um, she's a talented woman who has a resume that is, in short, incredible. She's a neuroscientist, a former Harvard psychiatrist, and the author of the book ESP Enigma, The Scientific Case for Scientific Phenomena. The book is incredible. Her resume is incredible. She's an incre incredible woman. Through her training and her experience, it's ultimately seasoned her to be able to speak on the taboo topic of ESP in relation to modern science. This is something that, to me, is, is very rare, and it takes a brave soul to come about, come out and speak on the topic. Um, currently, right now, she's got a practice in Medford, Oregon, and incorporates psychotherapy, psychopharmacology, and pet therapy into her compassionate healing of people who want personalized care. Uh, she's also a member of the board of directors for the Gene Houston Foundation. Um, her book, The ESP Enigma, The Scientific Case for Psychic Phenomena, is available through her website, dianehennessypow.com. That's D-I-A-N-E-H-E-N-N-A-C-Y-P-O-W-E-L-L.com, dianehennessypow.com. It's also available through Amazon. You just have to put it into the search engine there. Uh, tonight's program will be broken down into two segments. The first are hour will be an interview with Dr. Powell, followed back to another half hour of open lines. She has agreed to take callers, so if you feel inclined, please call in. The call-in number for tonight's show is 760-542-3929. That is 760-542-3929. And on to our guest, Diane, you're on the air. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sometimes stuff happens. Yeah, um, sometimes it does, yeah. So... Tell us about yourself and, and tell us why you decided to write your book on the subject of ESP. Well, um, what would you like to know about myself? Would you like to know what got me interested in the subject in the first place? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can look at modern medical science or or just science in general, and, and you've, I mean, you've got an incredible resume, and, and not too many people are willing to step outside of the box and delve in, into ESP, which is, for the most part, has been a, a very taboo topic. So yes, it has. What, yeah. Yeah, what, I, what well, well, when I went through my training in um, psychiatry, um, it was at a time period um, when, and this still is the case in general for psychiatry, it was at the time period when you were taught that if someone said that they could read other people's minds or be in telepathic communication or that they thought other people were reading their mind or whatever that that was a that was a sign that they were psychotic and people would then you know um get labeled you know schizophrenic you know schizophrenic or you know bipolar disorder with you know psychotic features or whatever and be put on medication for it and the, that whole paradigm was changed for me when I was when I was at Harvard and I was the clinical director of the consultation liaison service, which is the service that um, of psychiatrists that go to medical or surgical floors if, if there's a problem on those floors and they think somebody has a psychiatric illness, and so you go there to consult. And there was this woman who wanted to sign out of the hospital against medical advice, and you can't sign out of a hospital against medical advice if you're thought to be insane. You have to be mentally competent to make that decision for yourself. And so that's a reason why they might call a psychiatrist in. And when I went in to see this woman, she said that um, she'd been admitted with the um, symptoms of a heart attack and I, wanted to keep her for observation. And she said, I know I haven't had a heart attack. Um, you know, I'm psychic and uh, you know, the tests are going to come back normal, so can I get out of here? And um, instead of just, you know, when I went in to see her, instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, this woman's psychotic, um, and she even threw in there that I'm seeing all these ghosts and, um, you know, it's really creepy and I really want to just go home. Um, you know, a lot of psychiatrists would have just walked out the door and just said, okay, she's psychotic, she can't sign out against medical advice and put a hold on her to keep her there. But I sat down and talked with her, um, and she actually started, she looked at me and she said, I'm getting all this information about you and can I tell it to you? And she started giving me very specific information about um, what was going on in my life right then and what had happened in the past and then about the future. And the stuff that she said was going to happen in the future all 
eventually, you know, unfolded and, and came true. And I, it, it just it blew my paradigm because if, um, you know, to me as a scientist, um, you have to be able to explain, you know, everything with whatever your model is. It has to be able to explain everything. And if you have some, if you, if you keep accumulating data, you know, that says, uh, that doesn't fit within that model, just like what happened when we had this model of um, a universe or a solar system in which the Earth was at the center of it and all the planets were going around the Earth. And then and then we discovered that, no, that's not that's not correct. There was all of this information leading up to that, but it was a huge, radical shift to, to not view this Earth as the center of the solar system. And... It actually, I mean, it cost, you know, um, you know, I mean, we know what happened to, you know, Galileo, you know, for proposing that, you know, it was different than that. You know, he, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he took a lot of heat for that. And and that's, you know, and that's, that's the problem is that a lot of, there are a lot of really good scientists that have been afraid to come forth and say that they believe in this stuff because they're afraid of the heat. And I decided that after doing research and discovering that these phenomena um, have validity. There's a lot of um, long-standing history of r- well-done studies to um, show that. I-, I decided that I was willing to kind of go out there and and stand up for it and say, no, we, you know, we can't, just because people experience these phenomena, it's, we're doing them a disservice by saying that that it means that they're, um, that they have some mental illness. And then furthermore, um, we need to really look at our model for consciousness in the brain and we need to actually see if we can capitalize on this, not in a monetary way, but in a way that helps us to reach our full Absolutely. potential. What, what, are you, what is the feedback you get from your peers in the scientific and, and medical community? Um, it's, um, it's interesting because if I have the opportunity to, if somebody actually reads my book, um, I've had people who were dart high, uh, you know, skeptics, you know, they just were, they just say, oh, well, you know, I don't believe in this stuff, but, um, I know you, Diane, and, you know, you, you, I, I believe in you, and, um, I'll read it, you know, and, They've come back to me and they've gone, wow, you know, you've really, um, you've really given me some things to think about. I um, had no idea. And so I've had people who have come back to me with that. I've had people who never read my book but have said, you know, well, you know, I don't need to read it. I know it's it's got to be, you know, um, hogwash. Um, and so they... So they haven't really given it a chance, um, but so it's been it's, it's been mixed. Um, but what I've found is that people who already knew me were more open just because they knew me, and um, and then I found that people who read the book see that it's written in a scientific way and it's it's friendly to non scientifically trained people. I, I, I put it in. Um, I explain That's the jargon. Me. Yeah, yeah. I, I explain, you know, so explain the concepts so that people without that education can understand it. Yet at the same time, it's still scientifically accurate, and that was kind of the challenge of writing a book like this. But um, so it's been, I'd say, I'd say the majority of people have received it. But yes, there are definitely still people out there um, who've not read it and um, just see the title and, and they automatically draw their conclusions and. Those are the people I'm still, um, I, you know, I don't want to, I mean, it's not my mission to, you know, convert everybody. <laughs> it's just my mm-hmm. mission to make sure that the information's out there and to try to educate people and let people have an option to, you know, decide for themselves, you know, is there is there evidence for this? Mm-hmm. Where do you think consciousness, in, in your studies and in your opinion, where is consciousness in the brain or is the brain a receiver reaching out for consciousness? Well, it's um, 
I, I talk in my book about the phenomena of um, uh, out-of-body experiences and of um, and, and one subcategory of that is near-death experiences in which there's an out-of-body um, component. And those there are some really compelling um, studies that really make you question the whole idea that consciousness is... Um, linked to the brain in the way that traditional neuroscience says it is. And um, so what I, the way I see it is that, because I've tried to make sense of this, because you, you'll have people that are flatline EEG, which is the brain wave um, you know, that, you, that you record when somebody's, mm-hmm. um, you know, to declare them brain dead or whatever, Um and you can have people that have a flat line, which means they're brain dead, means no activities going on in the brain, and yet then if they get brought back to life, um, they'll be able to tell you what was happening during that time period that they were flat lined. Now, it's 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 either one of two things. It's either that um, that they their consciousness didn't stop just because the the organ of the brain was stopped functioning, um, or it's that they psychically retrieve information from the past as soon as <laughs> they get revived. It's it's one of the two. I mean, those are the two major hypotheses. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense how they could have very specific information, a lot of it from an out of body perspective, about what happened during that time period, and so. Right. Yeah, so so I've really thought about this a lot, and there's just so many accounts of it, um, and accounts by children, and, and accounts across various cultures, and it's actually a pretty common phenomenon. And so, I really think of it. I think of consciousness as being like a field. So if you think of like a magnet, you have with a magnet. You have the magnet, if you're just holding the magnet and you're not around anything metallic, it just seems like this heavy, you know, object. But you you get near things that are metallic and you see that it, like iron filings, and you see that it starts organizing those iron filings in a very specific way. And so there's a force coming out of that magnet that is invisible to you unless you have the conditions such that you can actually measure its impact upon the environment around it. And that's how I see consciousness. I think it's like like a field. Similarly, the gravitational field is one in which you will have, um, you know, uh, the way it was described, you know, by Einstein, it was sort of compared to, like, having... Um, objects like the, like planets, let's say, on um, this rubber sheet and that they would create this sort of um, indentation of the sheet such that any object that came within a certain, uh, you know, a certain um, distance with of that large object, massive object, would all of a sudden get caught up in it and start circling around it. And so, once again, it's it, what is that? You know what is that? It's invisible, but but it's having just the sheer mass of that object is having. That's what it's attributed to as mass. It's it, whatever it is. It's, it's correlated with mass. But all of a sudden, you've got this force field around that object that it organizes things that come within its field. And so I think that we have consciousness fields, and it organizes. Um, it, it organizes. Um, you know all kinds of things, and uh, does does this make sense? Yes, it does. I'm I'm, I'm taking it in actually. I, it's 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 a broad topic, and mm-hmm. I want to ask you a question here that it, it it's it's touching on my mind when we're talking about consciousness and the fields of it. Um, I've actually read most of your book and gone through countless interviews, but Eastern traditions consider the heart to be an an integral part of our consciousness as far as feelings and 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 then from there there's there's a lot of study going into dna as far as Mm -hmm. it being uh something that's light based and and it can actually shift through dimensions have you looked into that aspect 
of, of your I, research? I think, well, from what I've looked at, um, I mean, I think I, I'm really not that impressed with the um, the research that's done on DNA. Um, however, um, when it comes to consciousness, I don't think of consciousness as being something that's exclusively a property of the brain. I think that um, I think that the brain is um, it's it's one um, you know it's an organ within our body that. Um, that we associate with an electromagnetic field, and we, you know, we meaning Western science, you know, you know, associates it with also with consciousness. But I think that consciousness is actually something that um, is not just, you know, found, you know, in relationship to the brain. Uh, you know, I think that you know our brains. Are structured differently than the brains of, say, you know, a, um, you know, a slug or a, you know, a caterpillar or um, a dog or whatever. But, mm-hmm. you know, you know, so our conscious awareness or experience of things, you know, and and what we're able to do is slightly different. You know, we're we have more of this capacity for self awareness than you know some, you know, other beings. But consciousness itself, I think. Is I think of it in a much broader sense, and and so I, I would agree that you know just like people talk about the chakra centers within the body that Absolutely. there's a heart chakra, there's a throat chakra, there's a solar plexus chakra, that all of these different chakras are sort of um, you know areas from which you know um, there's a consciousness field. You know I don't I don't think of consciousness as just coming from mm-hmm. you know the, the brain. Interesting. That That's your question. It does, and and it, it does answer it as far as uh, you clarified Western civilization. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you you gave some statistics, or you have given them in the past, I believe they're in your book, regarding ESP and other medical conditions and the the percentages in comparison, say between ESP and heart attacks and strokes. Can you go over those with us so we have a a idea of how documented ESP is? Um, well, I don't have all the statistics right in front of me, but um, there definitely are certain conditions that are associated with a higher incidence of, you know, psychic experiences afterwards. And, um, in, like, for example, people who've had near-death experiences have a much higher incidence. People who have, um, you know, what's labeled bipolar disorder or schizophrenia have a much higher incidence. It's you know, so in, in psychiatry, they've said, "Oh, you know, they've kind of they've seen it as like rather than it being that people, you know, with certain conditions and their and their that you know these things are correlated, they they see them as like it, they see it as symptomatic. But I actually see that people who have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia actually report more of these out of body experiences. But it doesn't invalidate the." Um, out of body experience or the psychic experience it just you know they they just seem to have more of those experiences. People who've been labeled with um attention deficit disorder, people who've had trauma, a lot of the famous um psychics have had serious brain trauma, and so there there seems to be this if you're if you take you know our um you know the way that our brain is um you know you know like just sort of the, the you know sort of the prototypical brain and um it it undergoes trauma or it undergoes um conditioning uh in and training it it uh, there's this potential that can get unleashed um either way for having these experiences but our educational system our culture tends to not promote those um experiences and um and our brain actually has evolved such that we rely more upon analytical skills um rather than upon the more um you know the, the psychic sort of abilities to navigate our world around us Mm-hmm. Do you believe that uh, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, in the past, ha- 
had these abilities and actually used them and, and we're simply repressing them now? Or how, what are your stories, I mean, uh, what are your, your thoughts on, on that? Um, yeah, I think that through the evolution of um, Homo sapiens that we um, have suppressed a lot of these abilities that, you know, that they're actually, because the part of the brain one of the things that I do in my book is that I look at all of these different conditions, like dreaming, for example, is something that we all, ex- you know, we all experience. We may not remember our dreams, but we all do dream. And dreaming is an experience that a lot of people who who are not normally having psychic experiences, a lot of people actually have psychic dreams. You know, you know, whether it's um, having dreams of 9/11 before it happened, or you know, there were people who had dreams of the Titanic before it happened. They, they tend to be around issues that have to do with crisis, and either crisis on a massive scale or crisis to a loved one. And the the, the literature is just rich with stories of this. Um, and the part of the brain that is more active in dreaming, and also is more active in you know these people I've studied who have these various medical conditions, is the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that is involved with social bonding, it's involved with empathy, it's involved with... Um, now, it, it's it's the part of the brain that evolved, you know, after we, through evolution, after we went through from reptiles to mammals. So a lot of people call it the mammalian brain. But then that part of the brain got covered over by all of this cortex that evolved and the cortex actually suppresses the limbic system and so hmm. and but when we sleep the limbic system is actually more active and so what i find is that when people have head trauma and it damages the cortex or you know they have um ADD which is like a reduced activity in the frontal uh lobes of the cortex when you have those kinds of um Changes, then you have a shift in which part of the brain is um, dominating your experience of the world, and that when that shift occurs, where the limbic system is more dominant over the cortex, which is not the case for most of us, then you actually you, you see more reports of these psychic phenomena, and so that's part of the problem with trying to get the scientific medical community to accept these phenomena is that a lot of these people never experience them themselves. I mean, there's nothing more convincing than actually having the experience yourself. But a lot of pe- these people haven't, and they've got these big brains, you know, they are very analytical. <laughs> and, very, you know, and, and all of that limbic stuff is just so, you know, you know overridden and um, suppressed. And so it's, it's the reverse of what allows somebody to experience these things. Now there are two things that that stand out in my mind that you know, I want to ask you. Or as far as the limbic system, or is the right side of the brain and and the penile gland? Both of those are commonly mentioned with, with in the psychic community. How do those relate? Um, good question. Um, well, the first of all, the the right hemisphere. Um, is more associated with um, intuition, and in fact, it works in um, coordination with the um, limbic system. And the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have this competition with one another, and usually the left hemisphere dominates and overrides the right hemisphere. And our educational system has really emphasized that because the left hemisphere is the hemisphere of um, the verbal language, and you know, as we've gone from you know having a language where we're drawing pictures um, as opposed to you know words, um, or um, even the way we measure time, going from having something like an hourglass, you know, um, where it's um, it's more of a right brain kind of concept of time to um, you know reading a digital clock. Um, you know, we've we've progressively through culture had more of an emphasis on the left brain's way of organizing information. And but it it's so the left brain suppresses the right side of the brain and the right side of the brain works in coordination with the limbic system. Now the pineal gland 
is right in the center of our brain. It's right if you were to take a line from the crown chakra to the and and draw you know from top of the head down, and then if you were to look at the what's called the third eye, um, and you were to you know right sort of right between your eyebrows, and take that and move it um, backwards. Where those two intersect, that's that's where the pineal gland is. And interestingly enough, the pineal gland is what uh, Descartes, um, you know, who was this um, philosopher, um, you know, over 500 years ago. That's that's the part of the brain that he thought was where the he he couldn't explain where you know the 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 soul and you know the physical mat you know and he he decided it must be the pineal gland because it's the only part of the brain where it's just a single little structure as opposed to being something found in pairs and mm-hmm. that's also the part of the brain that um, Edgar Casey you know famous um, mm-hmm. famous psychic that's the part of the brain when he was asked what 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 part of the brain do you think is responsible for your psychic abilities he said it was the pineal gland and then there in eastern traditions um philosophies they talk about the pineal gland as being uh the part of the brain that's involved in the transformation of consciousness that's that you're able to visit these higher realms of consciousness um you know in kundalini yoga you know they they try to uh the idea is to bring this energy up from the base of your spine up to activate the pineal gland now what really gets interesting is that the pineal gland sits right there and in the middle of the brain and it is people thought that it was a what we call a vestigial organ meaning that it had no use just like the appendix people mm-hmm. used to mm-hmm. think now now we know the appendix actually has a use but people but you know but people for years thought it didn't and so they'd take it out really they just thought it was, a, it was something that was like a problem waiting to happen. Well, the pineal gland is something that people didn't see any use for it, and then they discovered that it secretes melatonin. They said, "Oh, well, it's you know responsible for our sleep wake cycle." Well, interestingly enough, the pineal gland is first of all, it's so it, it's right there in the center. It's bathed by all of this fluid. So that um, you know, the cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid that bathes the brain, so it can send a signal. But if it secretes something into that fluid, send a signal to you know the whole brain very quickly. But also, it's got more vascular input than any other part of the brain. I mean, it's as vascular as our kidneys, which is highly vascular. Um, and so, why would you have something that's like useless in our in the middle of our brain <laughs> that has like all, all this capacity to absolutely do something? And what is what does the pineal gland contain? It contains an abundance of DMT, and DMT is the active ingredient in ayahuasca, which is the concoction that shamans in Peru and, and other cultures ingest in order to have these hallucinogenic experiences that give them information about nature and about you know about life and so these shamans will ingest ayahuasca so that they can obtain you know a certain psychic information to use to then heal people and so here we have in the middle of our brain this thing that Basically, when we die, you know, or um, you know, have a near-death experience, releases all of this DMT. And there's a, um, a an MD scientist who did a lot of research named Rick Strassman. He wrote a book about DMT called it "The Spirit Molecule," in which he was like, like his big question was like, why do we have this like? organ with the chock full of this major hallucinogen right in the center of our brain. I mean, what's that about? And, you know, so he, he did research on, on that. And so I think what happens is is that I think that some people, like after they've had these shocks to their system, like a near-death experience or head trauma or whatever, they've they've kind of cracked open the egg, so to speak, and they've allowed more DMT to sort of get into their system naturally. And 
it activates the limbic system. So that's where the DMT is active is on receptors in the limbic system and it lights it up and 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 people have more psychic experiences after having had that happen. Have you looked into uh methods to exercise the pineal gland, pardon me, pineal gland as far as awakening it or is there an optimal place to or method in in achieving um like ESP type phenomena? Well, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's it gets into, you know, very, um, you know, controversial territory there, you know. I mean, because, I mean, there are people who, um, uh, you know, there are people who really try to, you know, activate this by, like, for example, there's a, there, there's a church in which people ingest DMT, you know, as a um, you know part of their rituals, and it was actually, um, you know, it went um, before um, uh, it, it went before the court system and to see, you know, whether or not these people had a right to, you know, ingest this, you know, hallucinogen, and they were claiming that it was, you know, their religion, and um, they actually won, and so there are people who do that, but they, you know, apparently, you know, they make sure that people are monitored carefully and they're not left alone. Um but you know, it's like you're you you start to like people take that route of like taking drugs, which a lot of people do, uh, to have these experiences. If you take that route, it's one of those things where it's um you know, it's it, it's it's playing around with something that could get people into trouble. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. not something mm-hmm. that I can I can advocate because you just don't know you know um you know for some people it 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 can be a bad idea you know um i have you know seen that as a physician um where you know people have done these things and i've you know had to work with them afterwards and because they're really their world's just turned upside down they can't function in society anymore and it, it was something they did on their own and they're coming to me afterwards saying you know what do i do <laughs> um uh, so you know, I think that um, what makes more sense is rather than trying to push it, you know, and it, to me, like, drugs are very powerful and, and therefore they can, they can like, push things beyond the, at, the capacity for the one's system to adapt to, you know, immediately. That That's one of the problems with them is that they can just push things uh, too far and so I think natural methods are, are much preferred because then you're working with your own system and it's, it, you're not going to, you're less likely to um, get to a state that your you, your system can't handle, um, if that makes sense. So you know, Absolutely. things like, yeah, so, so engaging in things like, you know, kundalini yoga or, um, or even engaging in things like um, there's a lot of, Evidence that just having really good feedback, you know, tr- practice um, and feedback about things, you can you can help to develop your skills. You know, like for example, remote viewing. The, the research that was conducted by um, the various um, branches of the military um, intelligence during the Cold War. I mean, found that um, you know people who didn't think they were psychic and who were going to be controls, that if they actually, um, you know, if they actually put the time into trying to do these things and then got feedback about, you know, what how close they were to the target, um, if you do that enough times, that they, they actually started to get more and more accurate, you know? And Let, let me ask you a question that, that I, I'm actually, um, we, we take live questions from our, uh, shf411.com sure. mini chat and nemesis 2012 wants to know what your opinion is on fluoride and does it inhibit the pineal gland fluoride huh yeah. like i water. i really yeah no I, I i've never heard uh, um i've never heard anything about that that's interesting i mean that, um can you ask her um what she's heard cuz i um I know that that's a big issue, whether or not to fluoridate our water, and um, uh, but I haven't heard that it would be an inhibitor of the pineal gland before. 
if, if they're listening now and if they have any questions, I'll just uh, I'm sure they'll correct and answer. And then I can carry on from there. We did have a guest that. Um, or a, I believe an upcoming guest that is a dentist, and they're on a, a, a national campaign, actually international campaign, to to rid the water of fluoride. They put a bunch of um, evidence together, and so that's still coming out and still a work in progress. Oh, but did actually, some of it have to do with the pineal gland? Um, I believe a lot of it does. I, I'm at, I'll i wait and see what Nemesis uh, 2012 has to say here, if he can provide me with any links. Um uh, I, I've read tidbits online. There's, there's actually, you know, I mean, you're the only scientist, uh, like official doctor, that I've ever um, heard speak on the subject. It, it, it's very non-mainstream, and so yeah. a lot of our information comes from, um, I, for lack of better words, almost uh, shaman-type characters or, or psychics. And so a lot of there is a lot of stuff online about how the the pineal gland is, is actually affected by uh, fluoride in a negative manner. Um, hmm. That's what I was curious well, about. Well, I, I know that um, in most people that, you know, by the time you reach a certain age, um, the pineal gland gets, um, it gets um, calcified. You know? That's what and, they're saying the fluoride does. Yeah, and, and fluoride, of. you know, I could see how fluoride might, play a role in that process, but I'm, I'm not aware of any literature to that effect. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, uh, that is that is what the, the hypothesis is, uh, that, it, that it's the fluoride that, that causes that. So let me ask you a question as in regarding, because you're, you're describing almost, you're describing forces and physical matter, and then we have ESP that is kind of, uh, uh, to me, what I'm visualizing is almost a third source. So you have a consciousness, which is a, a field. You've got matter. Which came first? Did did consciousness come first, or did, did matter come first? And then that rolled into a question of mind over matter. Do you believe we have uh, mind over matter abilities? Um, Such as whatever you set your mind to can be real. Well, I don't know that I'd say... I. I, I, I I, I wouldn't say that whatever you set your mind to um, can become real because um, I, I go back to the analogy um, with the magnet. Okay, so um, it's only going to organize iron filings within you know a certain within its field, and so there can be things that are outside of its field. At, you you could if you've got iron filings that are, you know, three feet away, they aren't going to be affected, um, depending upon the power of the magnet. So, so I mean, there's like a, there's there are limitations. I mean, so even though, you know, there's this ability, it's not like it's an infinite ability. Um, and I think to think of it, and so like, you know, for example, the movie, um, uh, uh, you know, what the bleep do we know? You know, it sort of suggests in The Secret, you know, in these movies, they sort of suggest that, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. if I wanted to be Magic Johnson, you know, that I could be. It's just a matter of, like, you know, programming my brain to think so. Well, I really honestly don't think that's like in the stars for me, you know. <laughs> right, I, right. You know, <laughs> I just don't, you know. I mean, I and I'm not going to put my energy there, you know. Um, I, I feel that there are other things, though, that – um you know, are definitely with you know within the realm of possibility, and um, so so I don't think it's like an infinite potential that we all hold in terms of you know that we could anything's possible. Yet at the same time, I think that the other extreme, which is the the extreme that is the more mainstream idea that um, you know that we're it's a very limited view of what we're what what our potential is, and I, we, we have far more potential than that limited view. It's just not an infinite potential. Um, so so that's that's part of the answer to your question. Um, what, what was the other part that you wanted to... Uh, do you believe that... Oh, which came consciousness, first, consciousness or yeah, matter? Yeah, like the chicken and egg, you know, is it, was it the egg or the chicken? Is it consciousness or matter? See, and I think that part of the problem is that... We tend to, you know, as humans, through our um, 
educational programming and just the way that our brain tends to work, we tend to think, we tend to pose questions that way. So, for example, I had somebody ask me once, um, well, is the um, glass half full or half empty? And I said, well, it's both. How could it, you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> you know, it's both half full and half empty, you know. It's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. end of issue, you know. I was like, why does it have to be either or? You know, it's not either or, it's both. You know? <laughs> and, but that that wanting to declare it as either or seems to be such a um, propensity that human beings have, that they want it to fall on one side of the fence or the other. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like, you know, uh, in quantum physics, you know, when you look at an electron or, or a photon, you know, it's sort of like, is it a particle or a wave? Well, you know, it's it's both, you know. And that's really hard for... That's so hard for the way that we're educated. That's so hard for us to, you know, go. Wow, it's both. You know, it's like we 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 are so stuck in this. It has to be one or the other. How could it be both? You know, we don't like that kind of way of thinking. We 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 want to categorize things one or the other. Similarly, we want to just we want to say something started versus before something else. You know, why couldn't they have just arrived at the same time? You know, why does the, why couldn't they, why does one have to be the precursor to the other? You know, it's um, to me. It's, it's a great explanation. Thanks. Definitely, great explanation. Let me ask you, uh, when we start getting into this discussion, you've said that, and in your book, you've said it on interviews everywhere else, that we're all psychics. We all have this ability. How do we hone it? How do we, you know, you you said that we, we're, we're trained, in, and I, I realize that on a daily basis in Western society we're, we're analytical, we're, we're trained to use our left brain continually. And how do you exercise your psychic abilities? How do you exercise the right side of your brain? Or how do you get your pineal, pineal gland to release DMT? Are there, are there simple methods that you've investigated as far as, um, getting us to move in that direction? Um, well, I mean, there, I mean, there's the, I think you're talking about, when you say simple, you're talking about like practical, sort of like, like, you know, anybody can do this at home, you know, as opposed to having to go to a research laboratory where they have specialized equipment and exactly. stuff. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I think that, um, first of all, um, doing activities that emphasize the right side of the brain as opposed to the left side of the brain is very helpful, um, and because it's kind of undoing that sort of, as I said, educational process that's put so much more emphasis on the left side of the brain as opposed to the right side of the brain. So, um, you know, the arts um, and um, you know those things that are not easily put into words. Um, those are all things that are actually more right-brained, you know. Um, spiritual experiences, you know, the sort of, um, you know, the, the traditions that are across the globe in which people try to experience states of ecstasy, you know, whether it's, you know, the whirling dervishes, you know, doing their Sufi dancing or, you know, um, it's through, you know, I mean, the Christian church put a lot of money into creating this, these magnificent cathedrals and, you know, this sort of atmosphere that when people walked into that church, it was like they were stepping into, you know, this experience that was um, very mystical and very different from, you know, just day-to-day common life. And that kind of stuff activates the parts of our brains that I'm talking about because it's going beyond, it's transcending this way of looking at things in this sort of, you know, uh, uh, way that so many people are trapped into of, you know, where they have this like, they're constantly have this to-do list in their brains or this worry list in their brains or this, you know, you know, all, all, where so much of their, energy and is taken up with this stuff that's like it's not serving them in any way it's not creating uh, it, it's it's like this little squirrel cage in their left side of their brain where they're just seeing all these things to themselves every day and 
and they're not getting anywhere, rationalizing things or or projecting the future or dwelling about the past. And all that stuff is like part of that, um, you know, the capacity that our brains have evolved, um, and yet it takes us away from the 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 parts of the brain that I've been talking about, like the limbic system, where you're able to really experience that, um, you know, sort of um, ecstasy, social communion, um, uh, you know, just, or or the right temporal lobe, you know, where it's more, you know, the spiritual experiences, you know, just, and, and when I say these things, I don't see them as, you have neuroscientists that will say, well, you know, I stimulate this part of the brain and people have spiritual experiences and blah, blah, blah. I don't think of them as being loc localized in that part of the brain. I see it as more like they're available in a much um they're available in a field of consciousness and I see the brain when people stimulate parts of the brain, I see the brain as being like a remote for the the T V. Okay. You know, it's just like, okay, if I stimulate the brain in this area then I'm going to get, you know, Fox News, okay? <laughs> I mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In this part, I'm going to get Comedy Central, you know? Very different experience, but it's like, you know. So when I say that, it's not that I think it's localized there any more than I think that, you know, Fox News is localized on, you know, these buttons on the pad of my remote. You know, it's it's out there in, you know, the... It's out there in space. The information's all out there in space. It's only, only just through my using this remote that it then gets onto the screen of consciousness from me. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that brings up a question, and it's probably going to be one of our last questions here. It's synchronicity. Um, what are your thoughts on synchronicity when combined with the ESP or a universal mind? Are we truly being given messages from possibly even the uh, Akashic record, or what are your thoughts on synchronicity? Well, I, I mean, synchronicity is one of my favorite topics. Um, it's, um, wow, I, I could do a whole show on synchronicity, I mean, alone. But um, it, one of the problems with synchronicity is that, I mean, to me, synchronicity really is, um, when you see all of these things, it's just like, oh, my God, and I could tell you lots of experiences um, that um, people have had that are just mind-blowing um, and um, well-documented. Um, but it's sort of like, okay, sometimes people will make a, a mistake. This is where people make a mistake is that they will interpret the synchronicities as a message that they're supposed to do a particular thing. So they might, like meet someone who has the same birthday as, you know, the, the first love of their life, and then it turns out that they're, uh, you know, they uh, they have all these other synchronicities happen, and they think, you know, within, you know, two weeks of knowing this person, you know, that this is their soulmate, and then they go marry them, and then, you know, a year later they're getting divorced because it's, you know, totally a wreck, you know, and so the synchronicity, so, so sometimes people let synchronicities guide them towards these major decisions that they really shouldn't allow themselves to get um, guided towards because that's not really, it's it's not that the synchronicities are happening to tell you that, you know, this is your soulmate or this is where you should go. It's 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 far more complex than that. But what they are is they are indicators of how um, beautifully um, intertwined and complex um, this um, universe is and consciousness is and how um, how it's there's far more order, there's far more interconnectedness than we would ever imagine. And um, chaos theory, I mean, the whole idea of the butterfly effect, you know, that if you have a butterfly over on one end of the world flapping its wings can create a tornado on the other end of the mm-hmm. world. You know, that 
that you know that's a statement about interconnectivity. It's one in which you can see you know how just a small act can cause dire consequences in another part of the world. But the reality is is that every you know everything is so interconnected, and to me synchronicities are signs of that they're they're manifestations of that interconnection that um quantum physicists um recognize at the subatomic level and these are what we're able to psychologically realize at you know at the like the larger macro level um but you know the universe is that interconnected you know whether you're looking at it from a subatomic level or you know a much you know, larger universal level, but we need to be careful to not interpret synchronicities. That's we we our brains are such that we want to throw interpretation onto something readily, and 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 we'll tend to interpret things the way that we uh, want to interpret them. You know, and we get ourselves into trouble that way. So we have to be. So I just look at synchronicities with awe of the uh, you know the universal connectivity, um, but I'm very cautious about like interpreting it um, in terms of saying okay, <laughs> well you know, yeah, people Absolutely. can really get in trouble. <laughs> so we're we're getting close to the top of the hour, and I want to ask you a couple final questions. What are we? Where are we taking this? Is Will the mainstream science become receptive to ESP and and the investigation of it? Because it, it's a topic that it's not investigated really. I mean, are we moving in that direction? Are we entering a paradigm where uh, an awakening of investigation and, and insight? Um, I hope so. Um, I mean, I have met a number of other scientists. Um, over the last few years, and I'm really, really impressed with the people who are doing research in this area. I mean, they are, they actually work harder, and their studies are so well controlled um, in comparison to the other scientists when I was in mainstream science, and it's because they have to be. It's they. It's just like when women were first entering the workforce. They oftentimes had to perform in a manner that was um, superior to men just to be considered their equals because of the way that things had been set up, that, that they you know, they were entering in as kind of the underdogs. And, and it's similar for the science, that the, the people who are really truly engaging in the science are um, doing so, and it's not in a... a, not in a um, uh, you know, sort of um, careless way at all. In fact, they're like they're more cautious. They're more ready. They're more ready to announce, you know, negative results than than the rest of the scientific community. You know, and discuss them and say, well, okay, what do we, you know, make of this? Um, I've never been to a conference in mainstream science where they present negative results. Whereas, I mean, parapsychology conferences, they do. They'll say. You know, we got a negative result from the study. And so they don't try to hide it when they get negative results. They're not trying to skew the data. They're just trying to find the truth. So I am I see it as, um, I, I see it personally, I really think that eventually, you know, it will become something that's accepted by mainstream. It, it, this is... If you look at the um, Thomas Kuhn, somebody who's written a book about um, scientific revolutions, there are lots of great philosophers who've talked about them, and they've talked about how difficult it is to change um, the paradigm that people operate under and how you have to go through these different stages. And at first, it just like it's rejected as absolutely ridiculous and absurd and insane, and then, you know... You, you make a breakthrough where there's sort of like a, well, maybe, you know, kind of possible, it's possible. And then, you know, you eventually get to the point where it's like, well, but of course, I mean, how could it be otherwise? You know, we are, you know it, like how we are about, you know, the Earth being the center of our... Absolutely. The realm system. of comprehension. So, 
Yeah, so so you have to go through these different stages. And, um, you know, so where we're at now, I think, is at a stage where it's um, it's no longer just, you know, that sort of, it's ridiculous, let's just not talk about it. Um, it's it's more at that tipping point. And mm-hmm. and and so I I wrote this book really wanting to try to tip the scale. <laughs> now, uh we're in the last few minutes of the hour. Uh will you plug your website, your book, and tell us about anything else that's possibly coming out in the future? Um, yeah, sure. Well, my book, um, The ESP Enigma, um, A Scientific Case for Psychic Phenomena, um, it's available um, through um, my website, um, which is D-I-A-N-E-H-E-N-N-A-C-Y-P-O-W-E-L-L.com, um, where you'll learn more about me and my credentials. And then... Um, and you can order, there's a direct link to Amazon.com, but it's also available to people through Barnes & Noble um, and, you know, various other online sites. Hmm. And, you know, I'm I'm thrilled that it's been translated already into German and Finnish and is currently being oh, wow. translated into Chinese. And um, the rights have been sold to um, translate it into Portuguese as well. So, um it's um, available in Kindle and um, audio and uh, paperback and hardback. And um, so the original hardcover came out in December '08. So I'm, I'm delighted that it's made it into all those different languages and, and uh, sort of forums, you know, so so quickly. Um, and in terms of the future, um, boy, there's just all kinds of stuff happening. <laughs> Um, yeah. Any more yeah, books? I, well, I'm I I'm working on some books. Um, there are a couple of books in which I've contributed um, chapters. Um, one of them's coming out in January 2011. It's a different topic, actually. I, I have done a lot of work um, with people um, from various parts of the world um, who are survivors of trauma. Uh, so the trauma that helps people to psychically open up is not just um, physical trauma, but sometimes psychological trauma can do that as well. And I've ended up um, becoming a um, sort of an expert on post-traumatic stress disorder. I've worked with people like the Lost Boys of Sudan, people from uh, Rwanda and Burundi, Burundi, where they had all of the genocide and Oh, wow. um, people from Liberia and Haiti and um, uh, people who were um, tortured by Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And anyway, I've, I've done, I've worked with in Russia with the people who survived the Stalin uh, purges there and um, people in Africa, um, in Kenya and um, Tanzania. Anyway, I just... Somalia, Bosnia. <laughs> anyway, wow. I've, so I've done all this work with people who have suffered really severe post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as working with you know American vets and uh, women who are survivors of incest and um, you know, various other sorts of sexual trauma. And so I wrote a chapter for a book that's coming out in 2011, in January, um, on atonement. And uh, one of the contributors is a um, grandson of uh, Gandhi, and um, I'm another contributor, and then there are some very illustrious other contributors. And uh, so that's something that I'm also interested in, is sort of this how do people, after you've had such a horrible thing happen to you, how do you come to a place of going beyond forgiveness, you know, but atonement has to do with the, the origin of the word is at one minute. And how do you actually become one again? You know, how do you become whole again? Some people think mm-hmm. it's impossible and it's not. Very and true. so so that's coming out in January. And then the following January in 2012, there's going to be a book coming out that um, was part of the think tank that included various um 
people who've done research on um, psychic phenomena, and um, we're each contributing a chapter to that. And um, I don't know the title of it, but it's going to come out under some academic press. And so, um, but but I'm also, you know, in, in the in the works is another book of my own. So, which is the service that. Um, of psychiatrists that go to medical or surgical floors if if there's a problem on those floors and they think somebody has a psychiatric illness. And so you go there to consult. And there was this woman who wanted to sign out of the hospital against medical advice. And you can't sign out of a hospital against medical advice if you're thought to be insane. You have to be mentally competent to make that decision for yourself. And so that's a reason why they might call a psychiatrist in. And when I went in to see this woman, she said that um, she had been admitted with the um, symptoms of a heart attack and right. wanted to keep her for observation. And she said, I know I haven't had a heart attack. Um, you know, I'm psychic and, uh, you know, the tests are going to come back normal, so can I get out of here? And um, instead of just, you know, when I went in to see her, instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, this woman's psychotic, Um, and she even threw in there that I'm seeing all these ghosts and, um, you know, it's really creepy and I I really want to just go home. Um, You know, a lot of psychiatrists would have just walked out the door and just said, okay, she's psychotic, she can't sign out against medical advice and put a hold on her to keep her there. But I sat down and talked with her um, and she actually started, she looked at me and she said, I'm getting all this information about you and can I tell it to you? And she started giving me very specific information about um, what was going on in my life right then and what had happened in the past and then about the future. And the stuff that she said was going to happen in the future all eventually you know, unfolded and, and came true. And I, it, it just it blew my paradigm because if, um, you know, to me as a scientist, um, you have to be able to explain you know, everything with whatever your model is. It has to be able to explain everything. And if you have some, if you, if you keep accumulating data, you know, that says, uh, that doesn't fit within that model, just like what happened when we had this model of um, a universe or a solar system in which the Earth was at the center of it and all the planets were going around the Earth, and then and then we discovered that, no, that's not that's not correct. There was all of this information leading up to that, but it was a huge, radical shift to to not view this Earth as a center of the solar system. And it actually, I mean, it cost you know, um, you know, I mean, we know what happened to you know Galileo, you know, for proposing that you know it was different than that. You know, he, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he took a lot of heat for that. And and that's you know, and that's that's the problem is that a lot of there are a lot of really good scientists that have been afraid to come forth and say that they believe in this stuff because they're afraid of the heat. And I decided that after doing research and discovering that these phenomena um, have validity, there's a lot of um, longstanding history of r- well-done studies to um, show that, I-, I decided that I was willing to kind of go out there and and stand up for it and say no. Uh, tonight we are joined by medical doctor Diane Hennessy Powell. Um, she's a talented woman who has a resume that is in short incredible. She's a neuroscientist, a former Harvard psychiatrist, and the author of the book ESP Enigma, The Scientific Case for Scientific Phenomena. The book is incredible. Her resume is incredible. She's an incre- incredible woman. Through her training and her experience, it's ultimately seasoned her to be able to speak on the taboo topic of ESP in relation to modern science. This is something that, to me, is, is very rare, and it takes a brave soul to come about, come out and speak on the topic. Um, currently, right now, she's got a practice in Medford, Oregon, and incorporates psychotherapy, psychopharmacology, and pet therapy into her compassionate healing of people who want personalized care. Uh, she's also a member of the board of directors for the Gene Houston Foundation. Um, her book, The ESP Enigma, The Scientific Case for Psychic Phenomena, is available through her website, dianehennessypow.com. That's D-I-A-N-E-H-E-N-N-A-C-Y-P-O-W-E-L-L.com, dianehennessypow.com. It's also available through Amazon. You just have to put it into the search engine there. Uh, tonight's program will be broken down into two segments. The first are 
hour will be an interview with Dr. Powell, followed back to another half hour of open lines. She has agreed to take callers, so if you feel inclined, please call in. The call-in number for tonight's show is 760-542-3929. That is 760-542-3929. And on to our guest, Diane, you're on the air. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> you know, we can't, just because people experience these phenomena, it's, we're doing them a disservice by saying that that it means that they're um, that they have some mental illness, and then furthermore, um, we need to really look at our model for consciousness in the brain, and we need to actually see if we can capitalize on this not in a monetary way, but in a way that helps us to reach our full Absolutely. potential. What what are you, what is the feedback you get from your peers in the scientific and, and medical community? Um, it's um, it's interesting because if I have the opportunity to, if somebody actually reads my book, um, I've had people who were dart high, uh, you know, skeptics. You know, they just were, they just say, oh, well, you know, I don't believe in this stuff, but. Um, I know you, Diane, and you know you. you uh, I believe in you, and um, I'll read it. You know, and they've come back to me. and They've gone, wow, you know, you've really, um, you, you've give, really given me some things to think about. I um, had no idea, and so I've had people who have come back to me with that. I've had people who n- never read my book. But I've said, you know, well, you know, I don't need to read it. I know it's it's got to be, you know, um, hogwash. Um, and so they so they haven't really given it a chance. Um, but so it's, it's <laughs> sometimes stuff happens. Yeah, um, sometimes it does. Yeah. So tell us about yourself and and tell us why you decided to write your book on the subject of ESP. Well. Um, what would you like to know about myself? Would you like to know what got me interested in the subject in the first place? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can look at modern medical science or or just science in general, and and you've, I mean, you've got an incredible resume, and and not too many people are willing to step outside of the box and delve in, into ESP, which is for the most part has been a very taboo topic. So yes, it has. I mean, what, yeah. Yeah, what, what I well, else? well, when I went through my training in um, psychiatry, um, it was at a time period um, when, and this still is the case in general for psychiatry. It was at the time period when you were taught that if someone said that they could read other people's minds or be in telepathic communication or that they thought other people were reading their mind or whatever, that that was a that was a sign that they were psychotic, and people would then, you know, um, get labeled, you know, schizophrenic, you know, schizophrenic, or you know, bipolar disorder with you know psychotic features or whatever, and be put on medication for it. And the that whole paradigm was changed for me when I was when I was at Harvard and I was the clinical director of the consultation liaison service.